our words and prayer, uh, they can be a vehicle into God's presence. But if we're not careful, uh, our words and prayer actually could um, do violence even to the presence of God. Yeah. I, I think for that, that pressure of having to feel like I got all the right words, I was actually missing the moment of, of just having communion with the heart of God. Well, hey, everyone, welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas you can use today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, today, today. to take your leadership to the next level. I'm your host, Ken Engel, president of Southeastern University. And I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And man, we are privileged today to uh, have our guest, Dr. Charlie Dawes. Charlie and his wife, Nicole, are the lead pastors of Hill City Church in Washington, D.C., uh, a great speaker, leader, author of Simple Prayer. He also served here. Southeastern, and and you're a graduate here, right? Oh yeah, two time, yeah, yeah. Uh, two time undergrad, graduate, yeah. Graduate, but you, I mean, you're a part of the SU family, so yeah. it's great to have family here today. And uh, you uh, you served in student development, uh, also an adjunct professor. Are you still doing any I adjunct? Am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> excellent. Well, it's great to have you back on campus, and uh, privileged to have a conversation with you today. I want to open up our conversation by discussing um, your leadership at at Hill City Church. Your mission is all about, you know, helping people that. Uh, to take the next step in following Jesus, whether that's a small step or that's a big, big leap. Uh, but tell us about this message, um, how how you're on mission to do this, um, especially in the area that you live in, and uh, which is uh, full of all kinds of things that go on in life. And yeah. and uh, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about that, and how it's impacted your church in that community. Yeah, I think for us, the uh, I came across a quote. Um, Eugene Peterson, uh, in one of his writings, he just, uh, the phrase was, every step's an arrival. Yes. And I think that that picture of, man, every step is something to celebrate. Um, and so whether a person's been walking with Jesus for decades, uh, I had the privilege of growing up in church. So, so much of my uh, identity, so much of all of my experiences, man, I, I don't know if I remember a time in my life where I would say that I was very distant from God, mm. but I still have steps to take. Sure. I still have maturing. I still have growing to do. And, and those steps are arrivals. And then we have people in our in our congregation uh, that are part of our community. We're actually um, the first church they've ever gone to. Wow. And so that, to me, that step is incredible. And I recognize that they're, a person coming to church for the first time, um, that step is an enormous stride. Like, it's not an easy one, and, and so many hurts and, and pain. Uh, but then I also see that there are steps for people in our congregation to take that have committed themselves to living in the metro D.C. area, because whether they're in government, uh, whether they're a military personnel, um, maybe they work in the private sector, they work nonprofit. They're there because they have a desire, sort of deep in their bones, to make a difference uh, in our country. And they understand making a difference in our country, really, it turns out to being a global impact as well. And so we have people whose life is committed to um, impact and, and making a, a sort of a difference. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're committed to making that difference in the cause and in the name of Jesus. Right. And so for us, like if we can have a place and introduce people to the way of Jesus, that when they begin practicing that way in their life, we know the ripple effects then will uh, impact their leadership. It will impact the way in which they host meetings and uh, the hiring, like all of that sort of stuff will be done with a with a heart that's tender rather than a heart that maybe has uh, been poisoned by this um, achievement sort of metric sure. that, that so easily can creep in. But yeah, we're just doing our best. We want to be a faithful presence. Yeah. Uh, we want to be a, a place where people can come and uh, they're known and seen. Yeah. Uh, my wife uses that language a lot, and I, I've kind of grabbed it and borrowed it. She, she says, man, I want us to be a place where people feel seen. Mm -hmm. uh, D.C., if you do any, any research in that area, is just known for being one of the loneliest places. Uh, people would identify as being completely uh, alone. Wow. Um, and so for us, we just want people to be seen. Uh, and we do that just with a simple smile. We do that yeah. with hello. And we, we want church to feel like home. Yeah. Um, and we want it to feel where people feel welcome and they, they don't have to feel strange or worried. Um, whenever I come home to my mom and dad's house, yeah. um, I'm not concerned with what I'm wearing. Mm. I'm not concerned with um, anything prior to walking through that door because I know when I get home, um, there's people there that love me yeah. and there's people there that go, hey, we're glad you're here. Yeah, and it's a unique community too. I mean, you have kind of three communities in one in the sense of you've got the national, it's the national capitals, mm -hmm. if you will, but then you've got the international yeah. aspect of that that you reach and then and then just the local yeah. aspect of that. So just a variety of, of people that you have access to, to mm -hmm. yeah, come alongside and show them who yeah. Christ is. Yeah. Yeah, and when I love it, and I've been to your church you know, a number of times, and you guys have this um, 
Hey, this message in the in the phrase you use is simple, right? Mm-hmm. So everything is is simple. There's this push to like, hey, what's what's that home feel? What tell us a little bit about that kind of mindset, the ideology, especially in light of the fact that so much of church can become so complex, right? Yeah. And become so high production. Why, where did that come from? And why is that so important to what you guys do? Yeah, I think to be honest, uh, growing up, uh, I'm a baseball fan. And so there's this, um, there's this thought that when you have two strikes, uh, you choke up on the bat and you just want to make contact. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I'm actually um, leadership philosophy, sort of church design. Uh, I'm not trying to, and I don't have a pressure to feel like I've got to hit a home run every week. Yeah. Uh, whether that's anything, I just want to be consistent. I want to be simple. Mm-hmm. Um, simple is not simplistic in the sense of it doesn't mean that it's less. It doesn't mean that it's rudimentary. It doesn't mean that we have, um, we're shying away from thought or, or intellectual mm-hmm. sort of ascent. Like, but what we're committed to is finding ways to take, take something and break it down to either it's a common denominator yeah. or just something that we can get our hands on. Yeah. I'm not interested in talking about Jesus in a way that feels elusive. Yeah. I want to make sure that it's actually accessible. Mm. And so for us, it's, we just want to keep things, the main thing, the main thing. Yep. And we're not trying to do too much. Mm-hmm. I think for us, we have to know in this season, um, whether it's the how old our church is, the places that our church is meeting, uh, the size staff that we have, the way that the congregation is sort of shaped. Yeah, we, we, we want to know what that is, and we want to be able to sort of meet the needs mm-hmm. that we've discerned, and we know that those things are going to be shifting. So we have to, uh, to, to use language and a framework that I learned here, we have to listen. Mm-hmm. There has to be a sense where we are consistently listening to the voice of the community and what's actually happening around us mm-hmm. and, and in our congregation. And that helps, that helps shape ministry yeah. design. One, one simple example, and it's not, again, it's simple. Okay. Um, we've got some people in our, in our congregation right now that are really battering, battling some, some significant health challenges. And so one of the things that we just did on a Sunday was we created a pocket of like, hey, we want, we want to pray one for another. Mm. And we're not going to overcomplicate this, but we are going to invite people to step in and, and, and have a moment of like, hey, I'm with you and I'm beside you. Mm. And, and for me, I think sometimes I've been in environments where we've programmed the service so much yeah. and we've professionalized the service so much that we've forgotten that we're there is a priesthood of all believers. Yeah. We've forgotten that there is something powerful when the person next to you mm-hmm. um, puts their arm around you and and they they cry out to God on your behalf. Wow! And so just finding ways to kind of step aside. But mm-hmm. we got a gentleman that uh, on Monday had a uh, a very large about, about the size of a peach um, cancerous tumor removed from his pancreas. That's a serious surgery. Yeah. Um, he was at Walter Reed High, uh, Hospital, and, and that day he told me he said I'm he said I'm patient one A. Wow. He said, I, I, am, I will have the full focus of, of that hospital on that day. And, and so he's going, going through this major surgery. And the way in which we've seen um, people from his city group wow. come around him, it, it doesn't make you know, pastoral uh, leadership uh, null and void, but it actually um, extends it mm-hmm. and it makes it more powerful. When, when, I'm, when they're literally saying to me, uh, we've got so-and-so coming by, you don't need to feel like you're, you, you, have to, you have to come by. Wow. And for me, I don't feel slighted. Right. I actually feel like maybe, maybe, maybe we're doing something right. Yeah. yeah. You it. planted uh, the church. Uh, tell us about that journey, uh, the uniqueness of that journey. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so many people out there that, you know, God's put that call on their life, but they, they kind of have this ideal of what it should be like. <laughs> sure. So tell us about that journey. Sure. Yeah, I, and I think I probably had some of those same ideals, yeah. um, but when you, when you plant a church in the middle of a pandemic... Yeah. Uh, like we did October of 2020, uh, you don't have the ability to do uh, some of the things uh, in the way that you might have read about, studied about, learned about, or heard about. I've got friends that you know can, can talk about these like mile markers leading up to a plant. And for us, our leading up to a, a meeting in person was that we were online for seven months. Wow. And so we were a, a YouTube channel mm-hmm. um, that had to fight to be more than just a YouTube channel. How do we create community when everyone is in their homes and everyone is uh, kind of going to church online? And yeah, so we started in that. But for us, it was a, it was a simple act of obedience. Um, we just, we felt like this is what the, the Lord was saying. We felt like this was the time. And so we, we did it. My, my wife and I have been married for over 21 years. And there's this phrase that we have in our house where, Lord, if you'll be clear, we'll be obedient. And so what we've endeavored to do over our, over our marriage and over our following Jesus is to shorten the distance between God's clarity and our obedience. Mm-hmm. And so God, when you speak and you're clear, we're going to act. And so we did that. And so we heard from the Lord. And so we, we, we stepped out 
not knowing what this is going to look like or how it's going to go. Looking back, I think I'm more um, I'm more nervous about that season uh, in, the, in the rear view. <laughs> right. I'm like, gosh, we we should have been a lot more afraid than we were. Like we should have felt terrified, but we had this comfort and this calm. There were a few few things that the Lord whispered to us, and we just held on to them. And we we wanted we wanted the Lord to show us that He was true to His word, mm-hmm. and He did. Uh, we met online for seven months, uh, and then after that, we got to meet uh, in May of 2021 for the very first time in person uh, in an AMC theater. And we were under heavy restrictions because of COVID guidelines uh, up in that area. Uh, for a long time, we were under uh, heavy gathering guidelines. And I think some of that, back to your point, has probably informed wow. the simplistic approach. Right. But, but I'm not going to lie and pretend that I wasn't frustrated right. that we get, didn't get to have this big sort of launch right. Sunday. Right. Like right. Our, our launch Sunday was mm-hmm. online. Dun, 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 dun. Like it, it mm-hmm. just, it, it was what it was. I now look back and I go... God, I don't know if I'd want to have planted a church in a different time or a different season. Wow, yeah. What seemed like an incredible hurdle and mm-hmm. challenge, mm-hmm. we are actually recognized this was God's runway for us. Yeah. We were able to do some things in terms of um, strengthening the church's financial position yeah. um, in a time that we're not having to invest in um, buildings or other expenses. Uh, we kind of turned the model uh, on its head, and we actually invested in staff. Before yeah. we ever um, purchased a piece of AVL, uh, we were hiring people for pastoral care. Because yeah. the only way to not be a YouTube channel is yes. have a way for people to actually receive care and have right. a sense of community online. Right. And so to, to look at it and go, man, this was actually, uh, the Lord was in the midst of all of this. And we were grateful um, that he was because, and without, without him, I, I don't think obviously it works or yeah. we're, we're still here. Right. Well, and there's so many things too that you, now you guys get to implement because of the rhythm that you've had where you were half virtual, this simplistic... I think one of the coolest things that I've seen one of the, your guys' church do, and I've seen a couple other churches do it too, is this this idea of the Sabbath Sunday, mm-hmm. where where you, you because everybody's used to the pre-recording, you can still provide that service, but you can actually like give your whole mm-hmm. staff and family. Talk to us a little bit about that practice. Why did you guys start implementing it and a little bit of how it works? Yeah, some of it was just um, kind of being forced to in some ways. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're when you see that sort of the rhythm, and we, if you've been in ministry long enough, you can see this sort of grind that can happen. Mm-hmm. You hear a lot of people talk about, man, wanting to be a life-giving church, mm-hmm. and we are a life-giving church, but I'm actually committed that it's life-giving not just for the attenders, but it's actually life-giving for the staff as well. Yeah. And so I think for me, it's like figuring out what are some rhythms that we could do. Um, and again, when you're renting facilities, uh, sometimes they put restrictions on you. Yeah. Um, right now, we couldn't meet the last Sunday of the year because it fell on the holiday. We couldn't meet the first Sunday of the year uh, as well. And so for us, we we leverage the online ability, and we talk about it with our with our you know community, and we let our staff know, hey, like this is a chance to rest. This is a chance to get your um, get your breath. One of the things I appreciated so much about my time at Southeastern was there are are very clear rhythms. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that that you would always talk about is is finding finding that rhythm, mm-hmm. and you know when you have to have high output, mm-hmm. and then you know when there's actually time to catch your breath. Right. And so I think if if the organizational sort of leadership is not de- helping to to point out those rhythms, we may have an expectation that people are resting and they're not. Mm. And so for me to be able to go, hey, these are places that we can actually catch yep. your breath. Right. Um, and then also like, it, it, man, what a statement that the church is not de- solely dependent upon Sunday. Right. Right. I, am, I am not the person Huge. that says, you know, we need to cease gathering. Obviously the Bible's very clear on that. I want us to gather. I think it's a privilege to gather. That's what COVID taught us, right? right. right. Man, we, we long for moments to be together. But if for a moment we think that the church was ever intended to replace um, the spirituality of the home, man, we've gotten so out yeah. of whack. And so I right. want to be a champion of that. I want to be a champion of the local church. Um, but I also want to be a champion of, of spirituality in your home as well. Sure. And so yeah. doing that helps us, helps us do that. Yeah. And you're, you know, you are a, a disciplined leader, especially when it comes to um, prayer reflection uh, and how important it is that we do build rhythms into our life to set aside time uh, to be alone with God. Yeah. Um, and so you can get, you know, the fresh word that he, he has, that he wants uh, you to share. And you wrote a book, mm-hmm. Simple Prayer, and you talk a lot about how we can deepen our prayer lives. And, and you, you know, talk about, you know, creating that rhythm. Tell us about your heart behind the book and what you're hoping uh, leaders can take away yeah. with that. Yeah, for me, I grew up in, uh, as I mentioned before, um, in really solid Christian environment, and I'm so grateful for it. But I also started recognizing that I started feeling a little bit of anxiety around prayer 
because I was um, I was around a lot of people that I thought just prayed really well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, um, yeah. For me, like, man, the, the, yeah, like, the, don't call on me to pray. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like yeah. ask so and so, man. They're, yeah. they're touching. They're touching <laughs> the hem of the garment. Like, right. I'm, I'm out here like, what in the world? But I, I, would, I would feel a sense of like, man, I, I hope I'm getting it right. And and so I started um, really leaning into just some different practices where, um, you know, my, our, our backgrounds, right, spiritually are, we grow up in like freestyle prayer, right. sure, if right. you will. There's a sense of like a script is the worst thing you could do for your prayer life, like <laughs> right, a, right. a liturgical rhythm <laughs> right. that is maybe, yeah. maybe satanic. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so for me, that also felt like a pressure. Like, man, it's, this has got to be... Because it didn't feel conversational. It yeah. felt like, okay, it's actually a performance. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, in our environments, you know, people that pray louder, people that pray longer, right. um, they win. Right. And so for me, I just, I just started recognizing, man, there have been some rhythms in the broader Christian uh, family that could really be helpful. And these prayers are um, well-worn, but not worn out. Right. And we can cr- kind of grab them and, and hold them and realize that our words in prayer, uh, they can be a vehicle into God's presence. Mm-hmm. But if we're not careful, uh, our words in prayer actually could um, do violence even to the presence of God. Yeah. Right. I, I think for, for that, that pressure of having to feel like I got all the right words, yeah. I was actually missing the moment of, of just having communion with the heart of God. Yep. Uh, and so it's some of the stuff I did in my, in my doctoral work. And then as I was uh, talking to other sort of publishers, their, their, their push was, um, hey, why don't you think about writing a, bo- a book on prayer that's more um, for popular press? Mm. Um, the reality is, is I think four people have read my dissertation. Um, one of them was my mother, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other three are probably sorry that they read it. Yeah. Um, but, but simple prayer was a way to take some of these ideas mm-hmm. and then go, okay, how can I help form formational practices? Yep. And so for me, again, some of the heartbeat of just of my own spirituality is what we see in our church. It's what we see in the in the book. Is simple's not simplistic, right? Mm-hmm. And the simple thing doesn't have to mean it's a lesser thing, right? And so for me, you know, we all learn that trick when you're when you're writing. You know, Doctor Ingo, you've written numbers of books. Like, you want your words to have weight. You want them to be measured. You sure. want them to be. You want them to count. And so what I found is in my in my prayer life, when I'll slow down and not feel like I have to bombard God with my words, but I'm actually fully present. My words feel like they actually have more weight because I was considering them, I was thinking about them. Praying the Psalms is a good way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, The Christian community has been doing this for centuries. Mm -hmm. Psalms are, it's the prayer book of the church. And so for us, like uh, using the Psalms, um, finding words and phrases and being able to hold on to them and allowing them to carry me into the presence of God uh, really, d- just did a wonder. Uh, I think in my in my my own personal prayer life, and um, yeah, I think it's easier than we've been told. Yeah, yeah. it's no. and I was the, the other day I was thinking about your book, and and in the book you talk about um, one of the prayers, the simple prayers, is the Jesus prayer. Yeah, right, the the in and out. And I was thinking about that in context. I was listening to a Huberman Lab podcast, mm-hmm. and he was talking about the physiological sigh as a way to quickly reduce anxiety in a high intense moment. Mm. And so the physiological sigh is two two quick breaths in and then a long breath out. Mm. And one of the one of the things I don't know if you wrote a I think you you touched on it but timing the prayer to those breaths, mm. right? Like thinking about the words of the prayer into yeah. those breaths. It, it's a really incredible way to fuse physiology with spirituality in that yeah. moment when you got like this, you know, difference. I was thinking about that the other day. What are some of the other prayers that you that you talk about? You know, these kind of simple prayers, the Jesus prayer being one of them, which sure. if you're not familiar with it, if you're not familiar with the Jesus prayer, what is that? Yeah, Walking so in. it's, um, first off, to help everybody's like maybe their heart, it's rooted in scripture, so we right. don't have to feel like we're, we're leaving the biblical text. Um, but it's that, that prayer, it's the cry for mercy. So yeah, what right. we know is that that is the prayer that is always responded to by God. Mm-hmm. And so it's the combination of the, the tax collector and the Pharisee, and then Jesus uh, interacting with blind Bartimaeus. Mm-hmm. And it's, the, it's that rhythm of Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a confession and a profession of, of Christ's lordship in our life. It's a recognition of, of who and where we are without him. Mm-hmm. And then it's the cry of mercy that we know that carries us to the very heart of God. And so I, I, love, I love that rhythm. And so the thought that I was having in my doctoral work, but then even in this book was, okay, we have that ancient prayer, that ancient right. simple prayer. Are there other prayers that have been offered to us in the biblical narrative that we could grab hold of? One of the ones that I, I love is when, when Jesus has the interaction with the man who says, I, I believe, but help right. me in my unbelief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there have been many times in my life where, where I'm just holding onto that phrase, Jesus, I, I believe, but Lord, help me in my unbelief. 
Help me in the, in the places where my faith is not fully formed or my faith is fractured. Yeah. Um, I think the reminder for us is Scripture never asks us to have mountain-sized faith. Right. It's mustard seed size right. faith. Right. And how many times do we feel the weight and the pressure because we don't feel like our faith is enough? Mm-hmm. And so I just say, okay, God, in that moment, help me there. And so I love that one. I love, you know, we look at the Lord's Prayer. So, so often it's offered to us, you know, as a, a framework, it's offered to us as a, as a model. But I think we can actually break so many of those lines down right. and just hold them because they have your kingdom come, thy will be done. Right. Like on earth as it is in heaven. Like these are phrases that I can hold and just sit and mm-hmm. allow, allow the spirit of God to speak. Ultimately, the, the Eastern Orthodox talk a lot about this, but that our, our prayer moments ultimately are to move beyond our language. It is that our, our heart, our spirit would then be in union with God. Yeah. And so if the ultimate goal of prayer isn't my words, but it's actually communion with God, then what I'm wanting to do is create space that in between my words, that the spirit of God might enter, that the spirit of God might come and dwell in that moment. Um, Soren Kierkegaard says, I, I used to think that prayer was speaking until I happened upon prayer was actually listening. Mm. Yeah. And so for me, am I creating space? How many times in my prayer have I said amen and not allowed God the opportunity to even speak yeah. uh, in prayer? And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, one of my favorite um, verses that talks about prayer is pray without ceasing. Mm. You know, and and what that is basically is what you're saying. You know, every waking moment you're engaged in prayer because you're yeah. thinking, you're reflecting, mm-hmm. you're, yeah. you know, you know, in the moment, God, what would you do? Mm-hmm. And you, you know, it's just mm-hmm. it's just that constant awareness where you're practicing. You know, yeah, a conversation with with the Lord or listening or yeah, yeah it's so good, so powerful. Well, we're going to move into our fire round. I know you're okay. familiar with our fire round. Yep. We asked three. Uh, quick questions just to grab some practical and applicable pieces of advice for those that are listening today. So, uh, Michael, you can fire away with the first one. Got it. So if somebody, you know, is really kind of inspired, they pick up your book and, and different things and they want to engage in a simple prayer life, what's the first step? To pray. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, to do it. Yeah, just to do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't overcomplicate it. Right. Don't think you got to get good enough and don't think you have to, it's not a, a certain posture of your right. body. Like, just do it. Just begin uh, I wonder how many things in our life, both spiritually and in other areas, that we we have the we were paralyzed by analysis. Right. And I don't think we need to do that with prayer. We just need to open our mouth and say, "Hey, God, I'm here. I believe that you're here. Mm. And now, now, why don't you meet with me? I think that's a great place to start." Yeah. Second question: uh, What encouragement would you give those who are listening today that may be um, right now struggling with feelings of discouragement and hopelessness? Mm. Man, I would. I tell them you're doing better than you think you are. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of times we, we view life through the expectations that we've had, whether it's a calendar or it's because we've seen someone else accomplishing something. Uh, I literally just got done talking about this in, in chapel with the students. Um, we say things like, man, I didn't think it was going to be like this. Mm. And sometimes that's paralyzing. But I think the reminder for us is that God's moving forward. The kingdom is advancing. And it can happen even in moments when we feel discouraged. And so maybe we get our eyes up out of our present circumstance and then see the work of, of Jesus around us, um, see those moments, but uh, also take heart. You're doing better than you think you are. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. Last question. What kind of, you know, as church leaders, you know, we talked a lot about all the different changes that have come because of the pandemic and how church is done. What are some of the, what are one or two things that church leaders need to be thinking about as they're leading their congregations and moving things forward in this new kind of context? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, I think COVID taught me that, um, I mean, leadership is surfing. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're riding waves and we don't necessarily know where the wave is going to fully break. We can anticipate it, but ultimately we've got to be nimble enough to once we get up on top of the wave, Yeah. don't worry about when it's going to break and when it's going to conclude and when it's going to end. Just ride the wave. Yeah. Enjoy the moment that yeah. you're in. Um, don't try to anticipate the next collapse or anticipate the next. I think anticipating is a, a beautiful thing, but if anticipation takes you out of presence, mm. it's 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 going to be just as damaging yep. um, as a blunder. Like so, for me, it's man, just be present in the moment, and and know that if we're talking about church leadership, man, it's Jesus's church. Yeah. Yeah. Man, our missions and visions, they have nuanced language, but ultimately we're all borrowing 
mission and vision from Jesus. Right. Like, we don't have to be the originator. We're not the originator of this. And so for us, it's like, man, so what has is, what is Jesus called me to be? I'm, I'm supposed to lead people beside still waters. Yeah. I'm a shepherd. I, I'm gathering um, the flock and I'm caring after them. That requires presence yeah. more than it requires uh, anticipation. Mm. And so that, that would be one thing. And then have fun. Yeah. Like yeah. have levity. I, I think, I don't know if it's a spiritual gift, but I, I hope it is. Yeah. Um, man, be funny. Right. Like yeah. laugh at yourself. Yeah. Laugh. Yeah. Like don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah. Um, this is the thing I remind myself all the time. Like, uh, man, just have fun. Like mm. I, I've, got a, I've got a teenage son at home. Uh, he reminds me, I'm not nearly as important as I think I am. Right. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a good thing. And so again, have fun, um, laugh, yeah. enjoy it. Uh, Jesus is the... He's enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so again, he's got it. It's his church. He called you. Uh, he's equipping you yeah. and he's with you. And mm -hmm. so just enjoy that process and enjoy that journey. And if not, and I, I think take some steps back and go, man, wait a second. I, I might be working and bearing a yoke that uh, Jesus never asked me to carry. Because yeah. if it's not in the way of Jesus, um, then it might not be for Jesus at all. Right. Yeah. And so I think I want to make sure I'm, I'm kind of locked into that, that rhythm. I love it. Yeah. You definitely live that kind of life. And, uh, you're a great uh, source of encouragement to a lot of people that you come in contact with. And Thank you. and you are a lot of fun and uh, grateful every time we have a chance to hang out. We yeah. laugh and Likewise. talk about a lot of good things, And um, but yet you provide a great sense of um, encouragement and support and strength. So appreciate how you model that yeah. and, uh, and lead well. So thanks for joining us today on Framework Leadership. It's good to have family at the table today yes. to, Thank you. So to, to discuss here. and talk. Grateful for your wisdom and insight you have provided us today. If you want to stay up to date with Charlie, you can follow on Instagram at Charlie underscore Dawes. Stay up to date with Hill City Church by checking out their site, it's at hillcitydc.com. That's right. Yep. Yep. And you can grab his book, of course, Simple Prayer, and I would encourage you to do so, and you can get that on Amazon. Any other site we can point to, or is, are those good? No, I would make a point, though, um, in a day that people just, I mean, really love and consume audiobooks. Um, I didn't get to record an audio version of that book, but if they will reach out and call me, uh, I'll read them a chapter uh, of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. You know what? You're going to have people take you up on that. So on. get ready for the phone call. The smooth tones. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is that I can't put it on 2.5 speed, which yeah. is the whole reason and why I'm you read it slow. It's right. A, it, it's... <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, That's for good. joining us yes, on sir. Framework Leadership Podcast today. Take yeah. care. Love it. Thank you so much for joining us today on Framework Leadership. If you're watching on YouTube right now, now would be a great time to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can get more leadership content right into your YouTube feed. You can also check us out on Instagram at Kent underscore Engel at Dr. Michael Steiner or on Twitter and YouTube at Kent Engel. And hey, if you love great email newsletters, and I know that I do, you want to check out the Framework Leadership Newsletter. Every single Friday drops in great tips to be a better leader, resources, thoughts right into your inbox. Check it out. You can sign up at kentingle.com. Make sure you hop onto there. Thank you so much for listening to Framework Leadership. Take care, everybody.